Solving quadratic equations. For our unit, this is lesson seven in the fourth unit, factoring and applications of quadratics. For my students, this is section 6.1 in our textbook. Again, I'm Mr. Brash. You can find all my videos at youtube.com slash Mr. Brash. Here's my email address if you ever need to get in touch with me. So as always, we'll do a little recall. How do you solve a linear equation? So I just wanna stress that this right here this is a linear equation and not a quadratic. X is only to the power of one right now. Well, in order to solve this, we wanna move all of the values away from the X by applying mathematics to both sides of the equal sign. A lot of teachers will teach it, you know, move the five over to this side and switch the sign. That's not correct. You want to add five to both sides. So let's add five to both sides. And now we're going to divide both sides by the two to divide that off the x and we'll be left with x is seven. Great, so that was solving a linear equation. And this is gonna be very crucial to solving quadratic equations, this skill. A little another side recall here. If we say that zero is made up of x times y times z, what value might x, y, or z be? Now individually, they can be anything they want, they're variables. But in order to get an answer of zero when you're doing a multiplication, one of these numbers, or more, has to be zero. That's the only way they'll multiply to zero. So it might be the z. The z might be zero. Or it could be the y that's zero. Now the z could also be zero again, but maybe not. Or it could be the x might, might have been zero. Now again, it, it could also have been the z or the y, but maybe not. So technically speaking, they could all be zero at the same time. And this is gonna be another crucial skill or piece of information that we're gonna need when talking about solving quadratic equations. Now what does it even mean to solve a quadratic? To solve a quadratic means exactly what I just did with the linear, is to find the value of the variable. And solving a quadratic is just like solving two linear equations. So let's do an example. Solve the following equation. Zero is equal to this factored form of a quadratic. In order to solve this, we have to understand the principle that I have at the top here where in order to get zero when multiplying, one of the items or more has to be zero. Now this equation is thankfully equal to zero so that means that either this particular factor or this particular factor are equal to zero. So off to the side, we say it's possible that zero was made up of x plus seven. And now we solve this linear equation. So we subtract seven on both sides. And apparently, in order for that to happen, x has to be seven. Or we do this one off to the side. And you don't need the arrows. I'm doing this for visualization. And we say, well, 5x minus 4 is equal to 0. So add 4 on both sides and divide by 5. And in this particular case, x is a fraction, 4 fifths, positive 4 fifths. So that means we have two solutions. The solutions are negative seven and four over five. And that's solving linear equations one by one, which in turn solve the quadratic scenario because either this was zero or that was zero. Now, of course, it's not always given to us in factored form, so we have to take that into account. So let's put this into some sort of real life context. You have a business, you're running your own business, and your accountant tells you that the company's profit can be predicted with an equation, and that equation is P for profit is equal to this amount, so P is the profit in dollars, and N is the number of products sold. So depending on how many products we sell, we'll make or lose money. Okay, so let's ask a question. When is the profit $600? So no longer am I asking you to just solve for zero. At this point, 
that nothing in here is going to be zero. I've got 600 in for p. And this particular skill, this is called solving for the roots. So if I make the profit 600 in the equation, we're going to have to do some algebra in order to make this work. So what we're basically doing is we're saying, when is the profit going to be 600 in the parabola? Now you're saying to yourself, you don't see a parabola here. Well, there, there essentially is a parabola here that opens downward. It's a downward parabola because the a value is a negative 2. And at some point, we're going to have zeros for this parabola, which is the x-axis. But at some point, we want to make $600. It might be the vertex. It might not be the vertex. It might even be too high for the parabola. But what we're looking for are these two potential points in time when we will make $600 in profit. So we're looking for the x values for when that's true. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract the 600 on both sides in order to make the equation equal to 0. And by subtracting the 600 on both sides, if you recall when you're in vertex form and your k value on the end is a subtraction of a value, what that means is to translate the whole parabola downward. Well, So what I've done by subtracting 600 on both sides, or more specifically on this side, is I've dropped that parabola down, the 600 y values, which in turn translates those two points that I'm looking for into zeros. So now I'm looking for the zeros. And I haven't moved anything left or right, so it's going to be the same x values. But this is not factored. So now I'm going to have to factor this, put it into factored form in order to figure out what the answer is. So let's do the greatest common factor of negative 2. So I'm going to factor out the negative 2. And I'll have n squared minus 60n plus 800. And now it's our job to find the two values that multiply to 800 that add to a negative 60n. And so it looks like 40 and 20 are the answer. And factoring is a skill that we would have seen in a previous videos and previous work, so you're more than welcome to go and check that out if you're a little bit rusty on your factoring. And so now we have our two zeros. And in the past, you would have just grabbed these directly out of the equation and said that n is 20 and n is 40. And that's okay. You can go right ahead and you can do that. You can say, we will make $600 profit when we sell 20 or 40 products. But the reasoning for that is the solving of the linear equations. If we say that n minus 20 is 0, because something here is multiplying to make 0, add the 20 on both sides, that's why the n is 20. And similarly, if n minus 40 was 0, that's why the other 0 is a positive 40 by adding 40 on both sides. You don't need to do this if it's pretty obvious to yourself. And then you just say, therefore, the company will make $600. Therefore, profit will be $600 if we sell 20 or 40 products. whatever those products are. And my handwriting today is a little bit atrocious. A new question for the same problem. How many products must be sold in order to maximize our profit? And we think about what that means in terms of the parabola. The maximum profit is going to occur at the vertex. So we are now looking for the x value of the vertex. Now how did you know it was the x value and not the y value? because it said how many products. It didn't ask what is the maximum profit. It asked how many products need to be sold in order to get the maximum profit. 
So where does that maximum profit occur? Well, the maximum profit occurs between the zeros. And we don't necessarily need the zeros. We just need any two roots because they will always be equidistant from the vertex. We take a look at the two roots we found. They're going to be the same distance from the vertex. So we're going to take our 20 and our 40, and we're going to say the x value of this vertex, or the n value of the vertex actually, because this is the number of products that we're going to be selling, is halfway between the 20 and the 40 that we need to get the $600. And so that's 30. So we need to sell 30 in order to maximize our profits because maybe we're spending on advertising or our costs go up or what have you. All right, a new example, the height or h of a ball after a certain number of seconds, t seconds, can be modeled by this equation. And so we've got this upside down parabola that is traveling like this and it's a ball and at some point the ball's gonna hit the ground and yes, it's gonna bounce, but we're gonna ignore the bounces. And we don't know where exactly our y or our x axis happen to be. So the question is, when does the ball hit the ground? You know, that could be the very beginning. What if it's a soccer ball? What if the ball started on the ground, it was actually a kick and not a throw? You know, that would be when the ball's on the ground and then it's gonna hit the ground and that would be another time when the ball's on the ground. And we can all agree that it would probably bounce, but we're just worried about that one particular moment in time. So we can assume that this is our ground level. All right, so how are we gonna find out when that ball hits the ground? What are we looking for? What's the question? The question is, when does that occur? And that's the zeros or the roots. Another term is roots. In the last question, we were looking for the roots when it was 600. Now we're just looking for the roots when it's zero. So we're going to plug zero in for the height. So the height becomes zero. We've got our already factored form. Whoever created this question was very kind and this one's already factored. You're welcome. And we're going to solve for the zeros. So it's either that 2t plus 7 was equal to zero. Or 3t minus 18 was equal to zero and we'll solve those individually. So subtract the seven on both sides, divide by the two. Add the 18 on both sides and divide by three. So now we have something to talk about. The ball will hit the ground after six seconds or the ball will hit the ground after negative seven over two, or negative three halves, negative 3.5. And we have to ask about realism, real life scenarios and what's possible and what's not. Is a time of negative three and a half seconds a reasonable answer? And the answer is no. Can you talk about time in the past? Yes, you can talk about past time. But when you're timing the traveling of a ball, you don't normally stop, start your stopwatch you know, at negative 3.5 seconds. That doesn't make any sense. You start your stopwatch at zero. Every, everybody would start their stopwatch at zero, where, wherever that happens to be. And so that means that the ball was thrown from a height that is above zero. So somebody threw the ball or hit the ball with a bat or whatever. So that makes this particular answer not valid. And the term that we use when an answer is not valid is we use the term inadmissible. This is not something that we will allow to be an answer. Inadmissible. And so the answer is six seconds. So therefore, the ball lands after six seconds. So example four, determine the roots of this equation. And this equation is in factor form, but it's not equal to zero. Unfortunately, it's not equal to something that when we multiply, we can just solve the linear equations. I can't just say, okay, well, that means that t minus one 
is negative 12. And then add the 12 on both sides and I'll get t equals 11. Or I sorry, add the one on both sides and get t equals negative 11. Negative 11, you know, okay, that's fine here. But when you do negative 11 take away 1, you get negative 12. That's fine. This is negative 12. Great. But negative 11 take away 9 is another negative 20. And negative 20 times negative 12 is not negative 12. That, that scenario doesn't work out. You know, this particular bracket is negative 12, but this particular bracket is negative 20. So that's not going to work. So what am I going to have to do? Well, I'm going to have to expand all this out and then add that 12 into the equation and factor it after that. So let's expand it out. That's not a very difficult task, something that we've mastered from previous lessons. And if you need to brush up on those skills, go ahead and watch those other videos. Check it out on Khan Academy. So here we are in standard form-ish. I just need to collect these like terms. And what I'll do is I'm going to add 12 on both sides. So 9 and 12 is 21. And that makes me equal to 0. And I'll just collect my like terms here. So that's a negative 10 t plus 21 and I got a t squared here so here's my standard form of the equation all right so standard form doesn't allow me to find the roots of the equation I need to factor it so what two numbers multiply to make 21 and add to make negative 10 the answer is negative 3 and negative 7 so I've got t minus 3 times t minus 7. So what we thought originally were the zeros of 1 and 9, they're not going to be the roots. The roots are 3 and 7. And again, you could show your work of solving those two linear equations if you really wanted to. You could write out that t minus 3 might have been the 0 and add 3 on both sides and get that t is equal to 3. And then t minus 7 is equal to 0 and then add the 7 on both sides and t is equal to 7. And that's all fine and dandy. Or you may have, from our previous lessons of factoring, just gone and said that the zeros or the roots are 3 and 7. Our fifth example. Solve this equation. Now, what does that exactly mean? Because you know, I've been asking you to solve for the roots, find the zeros. What does it mean to just plain out solve the equation? Well, when you're dealing with any algebra it just means to find the possible value or values of x that's what that means so that statement that statement of solve the equation that's asking you to find the possible value or values of x or of the variable and so we're gonna have to either guess use guess and check and plug some values in until we get 30 or use our knowledge of quadratics and how we're going to do this. So this is not equal to 0, and this is not in factored form. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to expand this out. So we're going to expand out this bracket. So that's x squared plus 3x plus 3x, which in turn will end up being 6x plus 9 because this is x plus 3 squared. And if you're a little bit rusty on that, you can go and check out other videos. But what x plus 3 squared means, it means x plus 3 times x plus 3. And then I've got the minus 2x. And that's equal to 30. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 30 on both sides so that it's no longer equal to 30. It's equal to 0. Let me collect my like terms. We'll have x squared plus 6x and then minus 2x. So that's a 4x. So plus 4x. And 9 take away 30 is negative 21. And now we have to factor this. So what two numbers multiply to make negative 21 and add to make 4? And somewhat interestingly, similar to the previous example, the answer is 7 and 3 we have to have a positive 7 and a negative 3. This is just a coincidence that it's the same as the previous example. I guess I really like 3 and 7. I mean, they are prime after all. And so the zeros or the solutions, they're asking us to solve, the solutions are, therefore, the solutions are negative 7 
and 3. And if you're wondering why I changed the sign, it's because we have to solve those linear equations. And is there a way to check your answer? Absolutely, there's always a way to check your answer. It's plug it in. So we've got the original equation. Let's plug negative 7 in. So I'll just tell the reader that I'm checking my answer. And I'll put in negative 7 plus 3 squared minus 2 times negative 7. And let's make that equal to 30. So all I've done is plugged negative 7 in for the x's. Negative 7 plus 3 is negative 4. Negative 4 squared is 16. Negative 2 times negative 7 is positive 14. And in fact, 16 plus 14 is 30. That's a true statement. And then you could plug the 3 in and do the same thing and find out that you are correct. And so that's solving quadratic equations. So that's it. It's now time to go and practice some questions from whatever textbook that you might have or on Khan Academy or find a worksheet online. They're very easy to find. And what we're going to do after this is we're going to find out how to solve for the vertex. We're going to be um, finding out where to find the exact values of the vertex. But not only that, what happens when they're not factorable? All of these examples I've given you have been easy to factor. They've factored just fine. So what the question is, what happens when it doesn't factor? And there's going to be an equation we're going to use for that. So thanks for watching. My name is Mr. Brash. You can find all my YouTube videos probably where you found this one at youtube.com slash Mr. Brash. Feel free to email me and please leave comments on my videos. I love to see them.